Hi there, thanks for joining me for another episode of Mr. Ed Codes. And in this episode, I wanted to take a two-part look into the procedures, processes, and tools that are used to make an object like the one you see here. It's a motion graphic cloud. It's done in a, a coloring book style, a very basic geometry, simple representation of what's going on there. You can see the cloud gets larger and smaller over time and it changes states. Its color changes, makes it look more gray or when it's smaller, a white fluffy cloud. And then there's a readout that tells you what the state is. So it's not, it's not a stunning program. I mean, you're not like, wow, that's so cool. But it does have a lot of utility, and that's what's cool about it, that these procedures and processes can be implemented in lots of different ways. So if you, if you can grasp the underpinnings of this program, then that's going to open the door to a whole world of programming for you. So that's my goal here. If you're still learning these techniques, if you're still becoming familiar with things like Perlin noise, this video is for you and it's going to come in two parts the first part will be describing the details of what's happening and then the second part will be actually programming this object so stick around while we jump into that the best place to start to learn anything <laughs> in p5js is of course the p5js website he'll tell you everything you need to know it may not explain it in a way that you completely understand it but they do provide examples that kind of help. And then if that fails, there's forums and you know, Reddit, there's a whole wealth of information. But even then, it follows similar lines of um, explanation, we'll say. So this is a kind of a way to get around the standard explanation and maybe approach it from a different perspective. So I'm gonna start out at the very beginning of how I came up with this program and the processes that I went through to get there. So I've been doing this for about a year now. If you follow my videos, you may know this. And after a year, I'm starting to catch on a little bit enough to, to share my experiences with people who are just starting out and maybe save them some time or shed some light on something that some difficulty that I had. And then how I was able to overcome that challenge is basically what I'm trying to get to here. So in the example page on the P5JS website, you can usually find that on a tab on the side. Just click on the example. It'll take you here and then there's different sections. We're going to go down to the math section and we're going to find something called a noise wave. You click on that and this is going to tell you about half of what you need to know to do this. What is a Perlin noise wave? In the example that they provide on the P5JS website, it looks like a water wave. And you can adjust some of the variables to change the characteristics of this wave. I almost thought that the, the way the random numbers are generated, it almost seems like to me it's the middle joint of a double pendulum. <laughs> That's what it almost kind of seems like to me because it's got that kind of randomness, but it has that uniformity, that pendulum-like uniformity, but it's varied, like there's something else messing around with it. So I, I really like the math from Perlin Noise. I, I probably should look into it in, in more detail and learn about how it's done, because I think it's really fascinating. But if you don't want to get into all that, all you really need to know is that here's the function that does all of the business. It's called Noise, makes it really easy. And it has some parameters that you can put in there. In this example, it has two, an X and a Y offset. You can include a Z offset for this and have three dimensional noise values or just one dimensional noise value. And there's even an example for that. We'll take a look, I think, uh, noise 1D. Let's start out even more basic. You see how this is moving back and forth? That's just one. If we turn it on its side and make it go up and down, and then we print successive noise values, or if we move along the noise with an offset, then we can get a very re a relational shape. And that's how the wave is formed. If you could imagine each one of these Y's is that last object turned on its side, 
kind of moving up and down, back and forth. Well, that's going to be really useful because that's a large, that's a, a, a number that's getting bigger and smaller in a random way, and we can use that to represent the change in some state. For instance, the size of the cloud or the cloud unit. So let's look at this this wave in a different way. I'm going to copy this code and I'm put it into this editor here. And then I'm going to change a little bit of the code so you guys can see see it better. So you can see what's happening a little bit better. So I sped up the wave. What do I mean by sped up the wave? You can see this wave is moving a lot faster than the last one. And why is that? Well, let's mess with some numbers and see what we can get to happen. I'm going to reduce the value of the offset. So this Y offset value is going to be less now. Per frame, it's only going to move 0.01. So you can see what happens there. So even if you don't understand the math or understand what's happening, you can definitely comprehend that if this value is greater, this stuff is going to move more crazily. It's moving a lot faster. Let's add a zero there and see what happens. Now it hardly looks like it's moving at all. And there's reasons why. And the more you play with this function, the more you'll understand and get to know what's happening. And the more you, that happens, the more power and control you have over this tool. So let's change the X offset. Let's reduce it and see what happens. And then the waves flatten out. The uniformity between the random values is increased. If I make this zero, what happens, do you think? Have you played around with this to find that out? Let's make this uh, five again. So we get those big waves. And let's make this zero. Okay. We're starting at zero. Every frame, we're not moving the second value in that noise. Here it is. Here's the function here. Here's the second parameter in that, that noise function. So we, if we change this value, it flattens the wave. It flattens that noise. It makes it more equal to one another. And if you increase the value, they're not as equal to one another. And then if you increase and decrease this value, it will stop moving through the numbers. So I'm looking at noise and I'm getting the same set of values every time. Let's slowly move through those values. We're moving so slowly through them you can't even see it. Let's up that magnitude. Here we can sort of see what's happening. Let's go up one more order. Okay. Let's go up another order. So you see what's happening there. You don't have to understand the math or anything. You just have to understand the features. Change this value. You're going to flatten the noise. Change this value. And you're going to make it move more quickly or more slowly through those values. So those features we can use and pass that characteristic on to something else. So let's look at this in a different way. Let me change these values back to something that can make a little bit more sense. Let me add this bit of code here. I put this in so you guys can see. We have this, this sphere. Can you guys, or I guess it's a circle in this case. It's getting larger and smaller in diameter based on this noise value right there that I've highlighted with this bar. So now the, the wave form, that's, that's one way that you can use the characteristics of noise to create a waveform. You can also use the characteristics of this noise to change the shape of a circle in a certain way. So if we can imagine for a second that this is one unit of a cloud, this is one billow. And if I put these billows together in an area and then do this to their radiuses, 
and then um, have them kind of overlap with no outline so that you can't really see the individual units, then you're starting to have something that looks like a cloud. So let's do that. Here I've numbered them so you can see what's going on and I have 30 cloud units all overlap together in an area. And you can see they're kind of getting bigger and smaller. So it's making a pretty cool cloud shape there. So let's cut these back a few so we can see what's really happening. I'll give you guys a better look. So we can see the area that they're positioned in seems to be growing and they seem to be following along in that in that area. So there's a magnitude that's being applied to the area that they're printed in and that seems to be growing and and shrinking, increasing and decreasing or oscillating. And then their movements, their radiuses, or their diameters, are kind of fluctuating. And at first they're not fluctuating so much, but then as they get larger, that fluctuation seems to increase. It kind of shows that the clouds are getting angrier as they get bigger. So how do I do that? Well, let's, look, let's take a closer look at that. So at the middle of the screen there's a graph. And that's the radius of the circle that corresponds to its point on the x-axis on this graph. And then its radius corresponds to the y-axis. So I have the array, the index of the array, corresponding to an x in this noise. And I have the radius of the circle corresponding to the y of the noise. And then you can see that there's a white bar a white line that keeps going that goes down and then goes back up and that's labeled your magnitude that's just a multiplier a way to get the noise to be more robust like increasing one of those values so that the wave noise is bigger and then decreasing it so that it's smoother so that I have an oscillator that does that and it's also tied to the size of the, the cloud shape so you can see up there there's a rectangle inside which all the circles are bounded. And as that increases, the position of those circles corresponds to the increase. So if you apply magnitude to the noise wave, you can start to vary the, the characteristics of it in a very meaningful way. So let me take uh, some of this stuff out of here. Okay, I've taken out the line so that you can see, so it's not so crowded. And now I'm going to increase the number so you can really see the waveform. So you can't really see it so much now. But let's add a two dozen. It slows the program down, of course. And showing all the text really slows it down. But for demonstration purposes, you can really see what's happening here. The graph is that wave from the examples, the, the P5JS example page. It's basically that wave. And the X position in that wave is the index value for the circle in the cloud. And then its height is the radius. And then I constrain those values using this magnitude multiplier. And the same for the area. Now you notice the circles are positioned inside the rectangle in kind of a, a biased way. They're all kind of hanging out at the bottom. And that was intentional. I wanted the cloud to look like it was being built from the bottom upward. So I put some math in there that kind of did that a little bit. <laughs> it didn't work out as intended. But you definitely can see that little bit of extra math pushing those points down into that rectangle instead of distributing it evenly throughout it. So when I made the program and then I wanted to make the video to describe the program so that people could make their own and do whatever with it, I was like, I'm, I just need a way to describe this better. And I came up with a diagram here. This might help you 
see things a little bit better. At the bottom, there's a transition as I'm building the cloud. So this would be what happens in a couple frames of the program. So the very first frame is I put all those circles on top of one another inside the rectangle. And that's one shade and they're not outlined. The first rectangle on the left is just showing you how the cloud is made of a bunch of smaller clouds. And then I take away the stroke and shade them a darker color like gray. And then I take that same exact shape, the same positions and size of those clouds the first time I printed it. And then I just print it again over the top, but a little bit smaller. And it creates the outline of the group. So that's what this diagram is showing. And it's also showing how the wave height ties to the diameter of the circles and how the X position of that wave ties to the index value of the circles. So I had that diagram, but I don't think it's nearly as effective as this one. <laughs> I think this one really sells it. The first, the diagram I made in Adobe Illustrator, which you can't move things. I mean, you can move things like from one position to the other. But if you want them to be animated, to move frame for frame without any help, well, you're not going to be able to do that. You need some other program. And there are applications that let you do it. But I don't have those applications. I have P5JS and the ability to be able to code. So that's what I did. I'm like, okay, well, let's just do what I would do in Adobe Illustrator, but let's put some math to it and make it move. So P5JS as a tool for just being able to describe things if you know how to do the code. This really didn't take that long to do. And the benefits of the time that it took for me to do that are great because you guys can clearly see what's happening. And it's a really cool science-y looking demonstration of something pretty simple. I can almost see this in the background on like a, a spaceship console. So there's lots of applications for even this, this program here, which is just kind of like, it's an infographic. <laughs> Here's the program that I'm going to be making for you guys. I'm going to go through it line for line in part two of this video. But in this video, at the, the end of this video, I just wanted to describe exactly what's happening with this object so that we know what we're getting into when we start coding it. So we know that we have cloud units that have their own radius that's tied to a noise wave and that there's an array of these and they all get their own little position in that wave. So we know that. We know that we have to group them into an area so that they all look like they're working together to be a cloud. And then we want that area to get bigger and we want the radiuses to get bigger so that it looks like the cloud is growing over time. And if we keep track of the magnitude, we can map it to the color so that it can change from a white cloud to a dark gray cloud and we can map it to a change in states from not dropping raindrops to dropping raindrops. So that's what's happening in this. We can look at the state value and put sunny or cloudy, partly cloudy, so we can register the state on the output. There you have it, the cloud shape, the procedures, the processes, what methods I plan to employ in order to get this motion graphic to come to life. So if you understand this part, then coding it is going to be a lot easier to understand. So I hope you'll join me in part two of this, where I code this line for line and explain what's happening. If you want to take on this challenge yourself, as I've described it, please go ahead and code that now and let's share notes. So thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. And as always, until next time, take care.